Dr. Ralph Metzner, welcome back to Shrink Wrap Radio. Well, thank you for having me, yes. Well, we spoke three years ago, back on episode number 386, in mm. which you gave us an update on mind-expanding substances. And uh -huh. at, that time, at that time, you shared your history as a student in clinical psychology at Harvard and your involvement with Timothy Leary and Richard Alpert, and uh, who became Ram Dass. And just to share my own bona fides here, so you don't have to start back too far, uh, throughout the mid-60s, I was a... Uh, doctoral student in clinical psychology myself at the University of Michigan and uh, was strongly influenced by both Timothy Leary and, and Ram Dass, though I never met them in person, uh, but they had a big impact on me nonetheless. And I did not drop out, but I did turn on and participate fully in the psychedelic revolution of that period. And so, so that's my background. You went on to publish more than 100 articles as well as several books. You became a psychotherapist in private practice, a professor emeritus now at the California Institute of, uh, of Integral Studies, and you became president and co-founder of the Green Earth Foundation. <laughs> so being the very productive person that you are, you've just this year published two books, one titled Overtones and Undercurrents, Spirituality, Reincarnation, and Ancestor Influence in the Entheogenic Psychotherapy. And your second book of 2017 is The Ecology of Consciousness. So I've just said a lot. <laughs> let's, start, let's start with your first book, Overtones. Well, let, me take, let me give the, the subtitle of The Ecology of Consciousness. Yeah, good. The Alchemy of Personal collective and planetary transformation. So, yes, and uh, you can hold up your other book as well, just so this, people can see it. Yeah. This no, the other book, Overtones. Overtones. You held yeah. that up. Yeah. yeah, I have that one, but I just want the audience to see it as well. So these are both very high quality uh, paperback volumes. And um, so let's start with the first book, Overtones and Undercurrents which is really a collection of psychotherapy uh, case histories, yeah, utilizing case. your own transpersonal right. approach. So what right. was the motivation of bringing out that particular book at this particular point in time? Well, it's to illustrate, I mean, Jung and Freud both, you know, all psychologists write case histories to illustrate their work and how it works. And, and, other people do do physicians and so on, to illustrate their work and to illustrate how people respond to them, um, you know. So um, and uh, uh, so I, you know, I, over 30, 40 years, I've developed uh, methods of uh, psychotherapy uh, that you could be called transpersonal psychotherapy. I call it alchemical divination, mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, then um, and it's described with, with lots of examples in the in this book too, in the ecology of consciousness. But then this one is specifically some of the more interesting, un unusual kind of case history of how people healed themselves or were healed through their uh, uh, their practice, which involves uh, involves the use of s selective use of small amounts of. Uh, psychoactive substances. Sometimes, not always. This is not a case book. It's not a case history of drug stories, for example. It's not what it is. The, right. the, to me, the drugs that are used uh, sometimes by me under circumstances when it's appropriate and legal to do so uh, in this country or in other countries. I, I taught a lot. I have taught a lot in Europe, and I've done workshops. In uh, I've done six. Uh, I've done six week long workshops every year for the past 10, 20 years. Wow. Uh, two, in, you. two in the United States, two in, uh, uh, in, um, in Sweden, in English language, and two in Switzerland, which I teach in German, because I was originally born German. And uh, so, uh, and I've accumulated a, a large number of stories. People write their stories about their experiences. And uh, in the tradition of psychotherapy, then I, I use those. So 
and my approach to psychotherapy is broader than the traditional one and that <clears throat> and one of the ways it's broader is that you look at the traditional psychotherapy you look at the relationship with mother and father and the oedipus complex and all that kind of thing but in a kind of i call it multi-generational family systems therapy is the name of the uh, best name of the kind of work that i've done mm -hmm. is multi generational family systems therapy, where you track ancestral influences to at least two generations, so parental and then grandparents, parents of parents, and then two generations down, children and then children of children. And those factors um, and uh, are very much influenced by the work of a, a German family systems therapist who was also a priest originally called Bert Hellinger. Uh, mm -hmm. And one other aspect of the, so the, it's when I say multi-dimensional, multi I mean the therapy includes uh, the mental and the emotional and the, and the sensory physical perceptions, of course, and then, but also you includes the recognition of connections that we have with the ancestors and, and with non-physical spiritual beings. So, yeah, yeah, that's, and uh, yeah. That's, that's saying a, a lot of it right there. Uh, one of the things that you touch on briefly early on in the uh, Overtones book is the distinction between uh, psychosis and psychedelic states. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can say a little bit about how one distinguishes. I, I remember back in the day, it seems like one of the terms that was being used was uh, psycho psych psychotomimetic, or was it yeah, psychomimetic? Psych psychotomimetic, yeah. Yeah, right. which was the notion yeah. that yeah. Uh, LSD and other substances would give a person an experience of what it was like to be a, uh, to be psychotic, right. and I think the answer is kind of yes and no. So tell right, us yeah. about about yes. the distinctions. Uh, and that was a psychiatric. One of the thing, interesting things about these dr drugs that might, might be called psychedelics more generally um, is that uh, there's really no agreement of what what they should be called. You see. And uh, that's one of the reasons. And uh, uh, there's a long list of drugs. The psychiatrists uh, who first studied it uh, looked at, because it exp when you expand consciousness, then it depends on what your consciousness is doing w when it was, before it was expanded. Uh -huh. And with, if you have the pers an appropriate set and setting for it. So uh, in a psychotic state, there are, profound changes in sense perception sometimes, um, but they happen and the person has no idea why they happened and uh, are freaked out in a, in a state of anxiety about them. Yeah, you know? that's a big difference between whether you've deliberately chosen to alter your conscious or suddenly you find yourself in a very strange state. Right, right. And, and, and very crucially, you have the knowledge that you took an actual drug that yeah. changed your perception. That right. you knew ahead of time, and I mean, yeah. you may not have understood how much it would change your perception. But the poor psychotics or schizophrenics, they don't have that. They don't have the knowledge that their perception, or they, they might have the knowledge that their perception is abnormal, uh, but they don't realize that it's a temporary state. You see, you have to distinguish that's between what psychologists call states and traits. Like the state is a, right. a state of consciousness that is time limited, it has a beginning, it lasts for a certain time, and then it has an end. You can return to the normal state. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that's very different than being uh, a psychotic. The poor psychotic doesn't know he's in a temporary state and doesn't know when it's going to end. Now, I, I use the word psychedelic, and and throughout your books, you tend to use the word entheogen. So what what is the distinction there for you? Well, psychedelic means uh, mind manifesting. That was a term suggested by uh, psychiatrist Humphrey Osmond, the, and Aldous Huxley, the idea that what is sort of, sort of imagery that we have in our mind becomes very visibly and dramatically visualized out there. Uh, and, and that's an okay term. And um, uh, uh, over the years, um, I've sort of gravitated away from it because it has now accrued all kinds of sort of cultural associations. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, like I remember at one time when my daughter was about 10 years old or 11 years old, uh, she came rushing in and was looking at uh, uh, and saying, seeing some Paisley patterns and said, oh, look at that, psychedelic, woo hoo uh -huh. Paisley patterns. You know? Yeah, Paisley patterns, yeah. 
psychedelic. Well, that's not what the psychedelic experience is about. You know, a person may yeah. see patterns and visual patterns that in the initial stage of a uh, LSD uh, experience that look like Paisley patterns, but that's not what the reason why people use these uh, substances. They use them to expand consciousness and have some insight and understanding. Um, and I'm talking about the serious use, the intentional use, not the recreational use, of course. Then if you're just recreational use, then you might enjoy the Paisley patterns or whatever and go yeah. dancing and all of that. You know? But uh, that's a big difference that I make in this. You know, I'm only talking really about the intentional, uh, st structured, intentional use of these substances for for for, for healing uh, oneself, self understanding, healing, uh, creativity, inspiration, inspiration of creative insight and inventiveness, in uh, like that, and it's basically expanding consciousness. Yeah. So now, if if psychedelic is mind expanding, the word entheogen, what? And what well, entheogen means uh, connecting to the spiritual dimensions. Okay, okay. Actually, gener generating a spiritual experience, which is also not perfect. It's very difficult. That's, that's part of the the philosophical conundrum about these substances. Is nobody can agree on what to call them. Everybody yeah. calls them something different from their point of view. The psychiatrists call, call them psychotomimetic because what they do, they see psychosis all the time, and uh, they see like what we would call bad trips. But entheo uh, the entheogenic um, is the idea that, uh, well, it has the word theo in it, which is religious, spiritual. So the idea that somehow it generates a, uh, uh, it's a religious dimension, the spiritual dimension, rather, I should say. Uh, people think of it as a spiritual experience, not necessarily a religious, not necessarily Christian or, or Jewish or like in a sense of the organized religion. But now it could, but then that's a whole area of research where uh, religious professionals have also engaged these experiences and have tried to make sense of it. Uh, but I lean more towards um, not any of the religious uh, perspectives, but more the shamanic, because um, the shamanic traditions, and I was very influenced by uh, the anthropologist Michael Horner, who's written about the shamanic journey. And yeah, the he's in this area, too. He's lives in the same area that you and I do, Yeah, it's Northern in California. Yeah. And the shamanic journey experience has the same structure uh, as a psychedelic experience. Uh, and But the methods, they don't use the drugs. I mean, in act, some cultures, they do actually use drugs. But the primary method of propelling somebody on the journey is the rhythmic drumming, mm -hmm. which uh, drives the brain waves. But it has that same structure. There's a there's a threefold structure, preparing for the journey, becoming clear about what your intention is, then going on the journey, uh, which is altered state, you know, where the people, uh, the, the shaman would just have an assistant, he would beat the drum, and the shaman would lie down on the ground and close their eyes and pursue the journey inwardly. See, it's an uh -huh. energy, just like a psychedelic. Yeah. Uh, and then and then the drumming stops and like the drug wears off and uh, and, and you come back and then you focus on the after effects and the integration, like the question of, well, what does this mean for my life? Mm -hmm. What is it in terms of what my intention was, if my intention was to, to heal this person, let's say, or my intention was to heal my, or to increase my understanding of something. Uh, uh, and then uh, how did that do that? How do I interpret it? And you talk about it with the therapist or with whoever the, <laughs> the guide was. I've, I've always been impressed or, or had the strong feeling that uh, powerful altered states of consciousness can be used to facilitate uh, dramatic change. And it sounds yeah. like that's a key part of your work. Yes, they can be, but it, it's, not, it's not so much. It's very hard to get across because it's not basically a drug effect. You know, you can't say you take this drug and you'll have a powerful expanded state of consciousness. That may or may not be so, depending on the set and setting. And nor is it necessarily true that the people who use it, use it for positive spiritual and healing purposes. Mm -hmm. I mean, Charlie Manson, for Pete's sake, used drugs like LSD to commit mayhem and murder. The yeah. CIA used it to brainwash prisoners of war, uh, slipping it to them unaware, thereby violating all the ethical codes. The ethical codes are that you never uh, change somebody else's consciousness against their will without their knowledge. Mm 
without their knowledge. It has to be conscious intention. Your conscious intention and agreement that you take this substance because it changes the way you look at reality. Yeah. It's an yeah. ethical violation. It's an ethical violation and totally un to give somebody LSD, um, you know, uh, uh, without their knowledge, uh, without a full explanation of what it's yeah. involved. Well, I think your work over the past 30, 40 years has shown uh, both uh, a strong sense of ethical commitment and also. Um, a very scholarly approach, you know. It, it, people might think, well, this this guy's taken a lot of a lot of drugs and some kind of nutcase running around with a lot of uh, far out theories. But I found that, that reading uh, reading the book uh, Overtones, I was really struck with the the combination, <laughs> the the rare combination of a of great openness. To, to inner experience and a kind of scholarly uh, con uh, uh, control uh, and presentation. So uh, I think that's, you know, that's quite a trick to pull off. A few people well, have done it. Well, thank you, but um, uh, that's, um, um, that's my role. So I'm an explorer, explorer of consciousness, and part of the explorer archetype is that you you explore <clears throat> whether it's you know the outer jungles in South America or it's the inner jungles of the mind and then you report back to the community that's mm -hmm. the ethics of it. and I'm also a psychotherapist so a healer so you know uh, I've worked with using these um, uh, substances in the context of uh, healing as an adjunct and amplifier of psychotherapy individual psychotherapy and sometimes group psychotherapy um, and uh, but also in the context of exploration um, and increasing knowledge, increasing creativity, everything always depends on the on the intention and uh, and how yeah. does that process work and how does it work uh, and see that the most difficult challenge in writing and communicating about these substances is that there are no other substances like that. I mean, you go to the doctor and you ask for a painkiller or an antibiotic. He gives you a painkiller or an antibiotic or, or narcotic if your pain is really it's severe. And then, it, you know, you do it. And, well, and you, don't, you don't have to th think about the set and the setting. You just say, take three in the morning and two in the afternoon. That's it. Set and setting doesn't matter. You can't do that with these substances. You can yeah. only... Well, you have to have a special arrangement and with friends and with a da 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 like that. And uh, uh, it's confusing because then you think, well, the effects that I'm experiencing are drug effects. So therefore, and the religious professionals often did that. Well, what I'm experiencing, I may, maybe I have a vision of God, but, but it's just a drug. After all, I just took a drug. So mm -hmm. it's not valid. So you don't write that off. Well, then some people did. And there's a yeah. whole of religious professionals, yeah. you know, in, in our project, and uh, when I was working with this group, I was working with Leary and Alpert in a, during the 60s, the mid 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 six mid to late 60s for a period of about six or seven years, mm -hmm. working very <laughs> at Harvard and at Millbrook later very intensely with the, you know, the three of us, but but also like a larger group of 20 to 25 or more people, shifting cast of characters. Uh, doing sessions and sharing and communicating the knowledge, writing books, giving lectures, giving workshops, um, like that. And then uh, all at the same time, the, in the culture, the availability of these drugs exploded. You see? Right, right, so, yes. And that was not because we did it. We weren't drunk, we weren't pushing the drugs. People said, often said that we were pushing drugs on people. Not at all. I mean, uh, uh, and, and selling drugs at people, not at all. This is totally untrue. We were like, uh, we run these sessions at Millbrook. They involved no drugs. People not did try drugs. And we said, but we, we'll show you, we'll do a workshop where you don't take drugs, where you learn how to do your own drug sessions. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Uh, um, so I, 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 one thing I found myself wondering was uh, how you were able to get your degree without being tainted, uh, you know, by by uh, Alpert and Leary. Well, no, that had nothing to do with it. Like it, in the in the 60, I got my degree in 60, 1963. 
Okay, uh, so you got 60, your, you already 60, had your degree early on. 62, 62. I, I was a graduate student, the third, fourth year graduate student. Leary, Leary and Alpert were two of my professors. Okay. And you, uh, you already had your, I didn't get my degree until 70, so uh, uh, I was out later. I had a postdoctoral fellowship uh, in psychopharmacology from the National Institute of Mental Health, which meant I studied the the two-year pharmacology course that all medical students take because I wanted to know more about the technical information mm -hmm. about these drugs, which are yeah. completely unknown to me. Yeah. You can have realized that in the early 60s, you know, LSD didn't mean anything. You could have said XYZ or IBM, it didn't mean anything. It was just three letters. Right. This is, nowadays, you can't say that. You can't say LSD and people say, oh my God, drugs, danger, kill, murder, yeah. uh, <laughs> madness, and yeah. these yeah. are so that's why I prefer uh, you know, a term like entheogenic because then you you, you have to kind of uh, the the main reason I like it because it brings the spiritual dimensions and makes it central. Yeah. So now you in your in your uh, explorations and journeying and so on, uh, one of the ideas that that you've embraced is uh, reincarnation. Yeah. I myself I haven't been able to go quite that far, so I'm wondering what. What experiences have you had that persuade you of? Uh, there, your book is really all about things that fall beyond what conventional science and psychology is willing to accept these days. Right. Um, what, what is it that persuades you about about reincarnation? Well, um, people who have worked with uh, psychotherapists, actually, who have worked with psychedelics uh, uh, and physicians who've um, uh, also worked with um, uh, uh, hypnotic regression, for example, uh, uh, work with hypnotic regressions. Just forget about psychedelics for a moment. Just uh, people in, in regular kind of psychotherapy and then sometimes doing um, Im guided imagery work would sometimes report that uh, people started reporting uh, their visions from another lifetime. And there's a whole field of uh, reincarnational guided um, psychotherapy uh, where people are going to sort of a light hypnotic trance state uh, and find themselves in another lifetime uh, and find themselves that, and this is the, the approach that I use, like, um, uh, these stories emerge just like in an expanded state or in the course of psychotherapy. Uh, people might find, well, okay, so the origin of this problem is in childhood. You know, and Freud and the others, they say, well, early childhood, the Oedipus complex and all of that. And then some psychotherapists went further and said, like Stan Groff, uh, my colleague and friend, and, and he said, um, uh, and others, you know, well, no, well, you have to go further, and and Otto Rank was another one. You have to go further to the birth experience, and uh, so the parent, what they call the perinatal experience, and the experience around birth uh, can leave a profound. The, the idea of the birth trauma um, mm -hmm. can leave a profound effect on lifetime long issues, uh, which in regular psychotherapy doesn't recognize. You see, and mm -hmm. there's only a group of specialists who have kind of embrace that approach and have their own professional associations and books and journals. And so, uh, and then some go even further, but not only around birth, but then also around the whole in, intrauterine experience and around conception. So what I, the conclusions that I've come to as a re result of the work that I've been doing is that um, before birth, um, there are three lines of uh, influence that come into us and uh, help determine, not control, but determine, help shape the kind of life we lead. One is the uh, before birth now, so including conception, for example. One is the uh, ancestral line through the father, right? Father line comes into our being at the moment of conception mm -hmm. because we have <laughs> DNA of the father. And then the mother line, uh, and all that the mother and the father represents, their own genetics, their own psychological patterns, their own family patterns, their own karma, whatever. <laughs> That's all uh, uh, plugged in, so to speak, pre-programmed -pro pre at the time of conception. And then, of course, amplified during the prenatal period. And then, of course, amplified after, during early childhood, as we know. And then the third line is other lifetimes. 
So that's not family, it's not ancestral, and it's not psychological, uh, and it's not this life. And I know I've read books from, you know, some time back where uh, that gave case reports of people who had uh, rather intransigent, intransigent symptoms that they were not receiving any relief from, from conventional right. approaches, right. and then they experience a past life regression and right. uh, the symptoms immediately lift and, and they experience a dramatic relief. Right. So I know those accounts have been out there for some time. Right. They're very convincing to the person who uh, has them. They're totally unconvincing to the observer outside, especially the traditional medical and traditional psychological academic um, establishment, which regards incarnation as a fanciful way out uh, theory, which for which we have no evidence, uh, which is flies in the face of reincarnation and uh, many lifetimes is actually the basic belief system of virtually all religions, Eastern and Western, including Buddhism, Hinduism, and early Christianity, and was part of Christianity as well, until about the fourth century, when mm -hmm. the Catholic Church nixed it out. Jesus talks about his past lifetimes in the, in the New Testament. Well, he's Jesus. <laughs> well, he's Jesus. Yeah, he's <laughs> he can do that. <laughs> and, and I, you know, I, I, I've gone, gone a lot into the history of the church and so forth. In the yeah. fourth century, the church was establishing its power, uh, and it controlled what was what could be believed, what could be stated. Mm -hmm. the power was absolute, and they decided that, um, you know, there are only. After, after you die, there are only three possible options for you. One of them is hell, and everybody knows how bad that is, and we'll remind you. <laughs> paradise, and paradise is pretty great, uh, but, you know, you have to be really like a, a saint to get there. It's, it's pretty hard. And most likely is purgatory, where you, you suffer for your sins for a certain amount of time. And uh, so... Um, this was the way I see it, uh, and many others too. So the, and, and, and so then there's no talk about in reincarnation. See, there's no attention paid to reincarnation at all. Uh, I didn't know that, that reincarnation had been a part of early Christianity. Uh, so that's, that's news to me. Jesus Christ talks about it. It's in the New uh -huh. Testament. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's the birthday... The, but the denial or non-acceptance of reincarnation has profound ethical consequences. Because when you think about it, if you think, well, after you die, basically, that's it, nothing happens. What does that do to your responsibility for your actions? You see, I can just fool around, I can kill people, I can do murder and mayhem. It doesn't matter, because when it's over, it's over. So fuck you, basically. That's kind of the attitude. And unless you think you're going to go to hell. I mean, that's the, the other... But if you don't believe that whole thing, and the yeah. official worldview doesn't yeah. believe it, and right. Christianity doesn't... Christianity yeah. doesn't believe it, because Christianity wanted people to, uh, to pray and to pay, to pay to the church mm -hmm. and get indulgences so you could buy indulgences. That was Martin Luther's complaint. He says, yeah. you can't pay off in advance for sins. He thought that was absurd <laughs> and ethically, you know, uh, criminal, which it is. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, the, thinking about uh, reincarnation uh, raised a weird question in my mind that I've never asked anybody about before. But, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, be careful about doing such and such. You might get reincarnated as a bug. Um, yeah. Yeah, uh, do 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 people so no. in in your view as far as you know when pe no. do people human always get reincarnated as yeah. human beings yeah. or do they get reincarnated yeah. sometimes as animals? No, no, no. Maybe animal like people, animal like yeah. people. Uh -huh. but, you know that happens in everyday life. Yeah. Now people behave in a brutish manner. Uh -huh. or, um, you know, behave like animals. No, that's, I, I wanted that's, to touch on another area in your book, since uh, all of the cases have some sort of uh, uh, component of something that stretches ordinary credulity. Uh, and you, I was particularly interested. You were sitting in a 
at uh, Mendocino, Mendocino State Hospital and, and listening to a woman who was uh, acutely psychotic at the time. And you notice that her thoughts, that there seemed to be a telepathic component because you notice that in the word salad as she was babbling, that some of her babbling actually reflected things that you were thinking about. Right, yeah, yeah. Have you yeah. had other experiences yeah, to, uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it's it's a view uh, uh, of uh, psychotic states. Like psycho psychosis is an altered state of consciousness, mm -hmm. in which your perception, your feeling, the way you're thinking, and everything is profoundly different from the ordinary realm. And um, um, and so, and one of the things is that your your sense perception, just like with psychedelic drugs, your sense perception enhances, so you become more more acutely aware of sounds and more acutely aware of, of vision and, se and sense and, and sense. But mostly in psychotic states, once, it, once you're given a uh, antipsychotic drug, then those things are blunted out. Um, but you, you're having these, this flood of ideas. So there's a, there's a release of the, normally, you know, the, 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 the ideas and the thoughts and the images in our minds are screened out for functioning. You know, yeah. because it's screening out a lot, because you and I want to talk here about this thing, and we're, you know, I'm screening out. I'm not taking in this the the sunlight and the through the window. I could, but I'm not doing that because my intention is focused on what we're doing. Yeah. In the in psychotic people or schizophrenic people, for somehow they lose the the ability to to direct your direct your uh, 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 attention uh, consciously, and it's being sort of captured and seized. And um, uh, and there may be like heightened sensation, so the paranoid people may uh, may listen to may hear people talking, and he can't quite make up what he's uh, w w what they're saying, but he feels terrible, so he thinks that maybe they're talking about bad thing about me, and that's why I feel terrible, and then he goes on that, or maybe the, and the taste the food tastes funny because the senses have been heightened. And then uh, maybe it tastes funny. It's uh, that, that's what's making me feel so weird because somebody put some negative stuff in my food mm -hmm. because it's basically a kind of a paranoid thing. Uh, my sense percept, my experience has changed, so somebody did it for me because I feel bad. And yeah. you no, know, it's the yeah. opposite. It's the opposite of a psychedelic experience, but it has the heightened sensation. So uh, I know there's some there's considerable evidence, if one accepts any idea of, of telepathy, that it's more likely to happen in an altered state of consciousness. <coughs> and so, it's, I gather it's not surprising to you that that would happen uh, when uh, someone's psychotic. And I know my own experience of being with psychotic people is um, you can really lose your boundaries. You know, they're in a kind of bound boundaryless state right. themselves right. and unless right. you are clinging tightly <laughs> to right. your identity you can find yourself um, yes. being drawn into that right because they're often very perceptive and they can they can zero in on your um uh, on your weird stuff that you've got going <laughs> yeah. and, uh, but the usual psyche psychiatric or psychotherapy in intervention is stated in such a way that <clears throat> that you're not allowed to do that. You don't do that. Anyway, they'll quickly give you a drug before you go too far in that dimension. And then yeah. you can talk it over with your supervisor, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, I, and when I told that story, I just wanted to mention that because I didn't have that agenda. I was not on the staff of the hospital. I didn't have to decide whether she was going to be hospitalized or not. You know, I didn't have to make that decision that was being made by the, the psychiatrist in charge. So, so I was just, like, listening to her and trying to empathically trying to get a sense. My approach has always been empathic, see, empathic uh, understanding and distinguish the way from em empathy from sympathy by the fact that it's a conscious, intentional, like putting yourself in the other person's shoes, but maintaining your own balance as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, experiencing something of what the other person experiences, um, but, uh, but maintaining your own sense of balance. Now, distinguish like sympathy. No, sympathy is a kind of a instinctive reactions. You know, if you feel sad, then I'll feel sad, and then we can bo both have a nice cry together. 
but it doesn't really solve anything. It's nice. It, you know, misery loves company and feels better to be with somebody than to be alone. Um, but um, it doesn't really solve a problem. Uh, but if you turn it into empathy, uh, and that's what the Buddhist teaching, which is the Buddhist term for that is compassion. And so they, they say you want to balance the wisdom, which is the insight and the, and the compassion. Because the insight by itself, vision, can be kind of cold and detached. Yeah, I see what your problem is. You're a psychotic. Here's the drug. <laughs> well, that's yeah. it. Go away. Yeah. Or, yeah. Um, uh, or you can uh, you can have too much co- uh, compassion um, and too much too much empathy uh, or sympathy. I would say unconscious sympathy. Uh, it's like the analogy: if you're going down the street and there's a hole in the ground. And there's a guy in the in the in the hall, ten foot down, and uh, and you come to the you come to the uh, hall, and uh, like with a sympathetic sympathy reaction, you jump down into the hall, and then mm. you've got two people in the hall, and they can keep each other company, which is better than being alone. Mm. <laughs> but the empathy <laughs> would say, or person would say, with empathy would say, oh, you're in the hall. Let me get a ladder. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, one of the other sort of farther out cases deals with demon possession, and that particularly catches my interest because I was raised uh, partly by my grandparents who were evangelical Christians. They would be called holy rollers, really? and uh, they believed very much in demonic uh, possession, and part of what they did was to cast out demons. Uh-huh. So. Maybe you can give us the highlights of that particular case. Well, that, that there is that is us that is a, a somewhat specialized field within psychiatry, psychology. Uh, many uh, many professionals don't go anywhere near it. Um, but the the vast majority of possession, you think of possession as an extreme of obsession. You know, when you're obs- uh, obs- obsessed with an idea or with a person. You can be obsessed with an idea or a project or a person. It's like your fo- your attention and your consciousness is narrowly focused on that person, <coughs> and uh, and what you want to do and the kind of interaction you want to have. And then when you, but you still kind of respect the other person as an individual. And then possession is an is a possessiveness is a trait. It's a trait of normal. You know, we think about the over-possessive mother or over-possessive parent, for example, or husband or wife, you know, who wants to control everything that the spouse does or that the child does or even thinks, you know, don't think that way, da-da-da. Uh, and especially if the child, for example, has uh, has an illness and is reduced in um, uh, in their own ability to take, take care of themselves, and, and I'll take care of you and... Like that, so possessiveness is this kind of a spectrum of obsession, possession, and possession is like, um, and uh, and traditionally, then once you, uh, so you know, the over possessive grandmother, the over possessive mother, it's like an this is something we know actually in our everyday life. Uh, but, but there, there are sort of two possibilities here. I'm sure many more than two, but uh, the conventional view would be that it's a a disowned a split off aspect of oneself, some unconscious aspect that is experienced as out there and being possessive. The other view is of it being a a discarnate, a demonic entity outside of oneself. Uh, And so where do you come down on, on that? I mean, it sounds like you've and that raises the whole question of of evil and the nature of evil. From my from my experience, the vast majority uh, of possession states are possessions by um, a, a family member, and the family member may be dead. You see, so mm-hmm. then it becomes kind of weirdly spiritual. In other words, if a child or a young person uh, is very influenced by their grandmother or their grandparents. Uh, and then uh, that parent dies, and the child grows up, and but stays until. See, then what kind of a worldview do you have? Uh, and it's still like uh, responding to, um, and 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 there is evidence that from from other cultures and the, uh, one one theory, one view. I'm not saying that this is necessarily the way it works. Is that uh, uh, 
some some people when they die they who have not accepted the fact that they're dead i've heard that yes they don't, if they die suddenly, for example, or they don't have a belief system that they can uh, that something of them remains after death, and uh, and so they're still clinging to what they had in the lifetime and clinging to an influence that they had, uh, wanting to possess a child, for example, uh, or uh, like that. Now, so I think the from my experience and from the reading of the literature too, the vast majority of so-called obsession states are states by uh, um, possession by uh, an acquaintance, a uh, family mm-hmm. member acquaintance. There is a small percentage of uh, people where there's some kind of demonic or spirit possession, in other words, non-human um, kind of um, thing. And then one, one of the stories in the book is like that. Now, in other cultures, uh, recognize this, uh, like Brazil, for example, possession states is considered normal. You know, uh, I mean, on the spectrum of normality, uh, and uh, and so, but but that's a cultural. There's a cultural openness to working with that, and there are methods that they develop for depossessing. There are therapists who have worked with that, and I have too. That are methods of how do you depossess somebody? I mm-hmm. describe in the book who's you know been possessed. And, and you reminded me of uh, growing up in that. Uh, holy roller environment that I did, there is the uh, seeking of being filled by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, which I never thought about that in terms of possession, but you're kind of linking it to the, uh, uh, you know, to voodoo and the Caribbean religions, uh, where they would seek out that ecstatic state of Uh of being possessed. Right, yeah. And see, to me... um, I go with those people who say, and including some of the traditional uh, teachers in, in other cultures who work in this in this field, who work uh, is um, you might say a controlled possession trance, uh, like inspiration uh, is like that, and uh, like uh, in a in a contr- in a controlled intentional intentional way, tuning into an ancestral spirit, for example. So a shaman, for example, might have um, uh, an, an elder or a, a parent, father or gra- mother or grandparent or father who was very uh, sp- sp- their spiritual guide and remains their spiritual guide after they died. And so I've been in Native American ceremonies where the people will say, "No, oh, I'm tuning into grandfather and my uh, great grandfather," and but and but also, you know, he's still alive. And then the grandfather. Uh, who passed, and uh, and these are the p- people that I tune into, and then they may tune into um, spirits of the culture that we would, and then that gets into what we would call deities, <laughs> you know, the mm-hmm. deities, the p- uh, protective deities of a whole tribe or a whole culture, uh, and uh, so then Christians would say, well, I'm, I, you know, when Jesus said himself, when two or more are gathered in my name, I will be there. That's in the Bible, right? When two or three mm-hmm. is in my name, I will right. be there. You call yeah. the name. The way you connect with ancestors, you call their name. It's called an invocation. And um, the holy rollers, they do, they do the same thing. Or the Baptists who you know, pra- praise the Lord and they feel the spirit of the Lord within them. So this is a whole spectrum of the degree to which you let yourself be not controlled, but let yourself express and channel. Um, to my mind, the more interesting experiences and more worthwhile in the long range are the ones where there's there's always some degree you maintain some connection with the here now, and you work with that difference between what is the spirit telling you and what what are you what can you use what you can you channel how can you apply mm-hmm. in healing your own healing healing mm-hmm. of other your art whatever it may be. Yeah, that sounds like a good integration of of a Western mode and uh you know right. and the shamanic mode yeah and uh, let's talk a little bit about your other book which unfortunately uh somebody was supposed to send me a copy and uh, the time was too short and so i didn't get the copy i was browsing a little bit on amazon uh, they let you leaf through the book a little bit <laughs> uh which was nice and one idea that that stuck 
out for me was that you were talking about hierarchy, and then you talked about holyarchy or holarchy. Right. Yeah, and I haven't ever encountered that word before. Uh, there must be a whole lot that you have to say around that. Right, right. Well, a hierarchy uh, is um, it's um, it's a model of uh, um, uh, power and information, no power and knowledge flow. It's a one-way flow of power and knowledge. For example, there's a hierarchy involved in the Catholic Church. In the Church, you know, there's a pope. At the, top, at the top of the hierarchy, and then there's bishops and archbishops, and then there's priests, and uh, and each one of them has the idea is like has more of the spiritual power and the spiritual authority, and so there's a focus of spiritual power and authority that flows down to the parishioners and the parish priests, and then eventually to the people in their <laughs> in their ceremonies, and then uh, um, then there are uh, the military, for example, is a yeah, prime right. example of a hierarchical structure, and sure. it's nece it's necessary. You know, you you want to have uh, command, control, and communication. That's the way the, the CCC that they, that's the language they always use. You know, the general, and then the colonel, and then the lieutenant, and then da, da, all the way down to the sergeant, down to the grunt. Information and con control goes one way only. Yeah, and and no questioning. You know, yes, right. sir. <laughs> I, I don't understand. Why you're telling me to wash the toilet, but I'll do it. Yes, sir. <laughs> right. And uh, um, and you can see where the military likes that, and they want that because if you're in a fight, you want the general to be able to issue orders and have the people actually do that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, and the uh, government too is or, or mostly organized that way. Uh, yeah. And businesses, government and it's, corporations. That's exactly, exactly what yeah. I was going to say. I often wondered about why do why do the 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 leaders of corporations they called chief executive officer. I mean, think of that. That's a those are all that's a military language, right? Yeah, so, right. It is <laughs> executive. I always think about execution. It's somehow it's the same <laughs> word as execution. Go. Ex Execute and people are getting, you know, in in the discussions in the business world is very interesting because people are now like women, for example, are saying, "Well, wait a minute, I you, you can't order me around like somebody, you know, I don't, I'm not being treated as a woman, I'm not being treated as a human being with respect. You can't do that. It's, this is a very live issue. The the business yeah. culture is very militaristic, and very hierarchical, you know. I never over thought about the language, uh, you know, like <laughs> exec. <laughs> Keep and people are, decide. they get a raise based upon their ability to execute. Yeah. Right? <laughs> operating officers, you know, move people around. Yeah, go fire these people. Go fire yeah. these people. Yeah. And, you, know, so, you don't think of it as a model. It, but there are other ways to organize a business. Well, tell us about holarchy. What is a holarchy? So holarchy is natural. It's nature. It's holarchical. It's holes with... Uh, parts within holes and uh, each uh, a whole a whole system that has parts and that whole system is itself a part of a larger whole system take the human body the human body has these different organs the liver the brain the heart and so forth it's a holarchy it's not a hierarchy the, none of the organs gives orders to the other organs to function. They function They function in a communication way, two-way flow of communication. Integration, uh, harmonization, balancing, integration, like that. In fact, yeah. if one part tries to give orders to another part, that's often what we call psychosomatic illness, that somebody is like head dominant. The head is constantly trying to control, tell the heart what to do and what to feel. Mm -hmm. And the heart says, well, no, you know, I don't really feel like doing that. So, yeah, yeah. or the sexual organs, for example, might have their own, you know, agenda that's quite independent of what the person thinks and wants, notoriously so. So right. the body is a, is a whole arcade. Now, then, uh, then uh, from that, it goes up because the, the individual is a part of a family. The family is not a hierarchy. It's not. Some families might try to be like a hierarchy. It's a it's a holarchy where each person is recognized as has their particular role, the mother role, the father role, the brothers, the sisters, 
like that. They have their role and they work with each other and it's interactive. And then the family might be part of a, a larger community and the community is, might be the village and they also, each family has its, you know, respects its own and then the community. So the family and the community and that's just the human and then the society and then let's say the nation state and then the whole, the whole civilization of a culture. Now, uh, you can also go um, the holarchy in the other direction. So, because um, the or each of the organs is an assembly of hundreds of thousands of cells, uh, and uh, they that's not a hierarchy. They don't issue orders to the cells, as we know. All, all biochemistry and you know gives us detailed uh, the levels of the sciences study at the, each level, at the physiological level, at the biochemical level, then at the cellular level. The cells are part of clusters of cells and uh, uh, the cell itself is a holarchical organization has the different parts uh, and then down to molecules molecules are configurations of elements of atoms uh, that have their own science so molecular ke uh, chemistry and uh, atomic physics and then even the atom is not an individual idea. People used to think you can reduce everything to atoms. Well, it's absurd. You can't reduce everything to atoms. First of all, it's not fundamental. There's subatomic particles like quartz and weird particles that sort of disappear and you can't really see them and they're not really there. They're only like probability waves. And yeah. in time, we're living and we're doing all this stuff. We're not dependent on that. Uh, on that system, understanding that system in order to function. So at each level. The system functions at each level in, independently, but connected with uh, the levels above and the levels below. Yeah, and, and also one of the things that, that I'm increasingly interested in is that uh, the boundaries are not nearly so sharp as we tend to think. Exactly. Uh, we th we exactly. think our skin is the boundary of what I call me, and right. now there's all this information about the biome. <laughs> These uh, sort of what we would call the despised otherness of our <laughs> of our colon, right? Oh, and and there are all these organisms in there that are crucial to our well-being. Well, exactly. Yeah, microbes and bacteria. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, but, and, the, and, and uh, we have the symbiotic people. relationship with them. And are they? Inside or outside, or you know, it's all right, right. Yeah, and our body, our bodies are miraculously and beautifully evolved uh, to uh, with the communication back and forth between the different levels, between the organs and the cells, and the cell between uh, the microbes and in the environment. And you know, they have the whole defense system, or the, so they can cells can distinguish between microbes that are beneficial and serve as nourishment and those that are maybe threatening and dangerous because if they didn't then we wouldn't have survived you see mm -hmm. the survival depends on being being having an, uh, a system way of working and also just def defending yourself and dealing with threats from the environment and uh, we're totally dependent on uh, the friendly bacteria in, uh, and uh, the immune system um, the, that um, the many, which has many different aspects, defends the integrity of our of the organism in the environment in which we in which we are raised. And then, if we move to a different environment or the environment changes, then we get <clears throat> all these uh, classical what we call the diseases of civilization or the diseases that are dependent on. Um, so the idea of the hierarchy is is sort of intuitively correct. We know it's correct. Um, but and and we function with it in in the sciences, uh, but in the uh, in our sciences, um, you know, people tend to f focus just on the one that they know best. They say, "Well, I don't know about that other stuff." But that's one yeah. of the things that happens with c expanded consciousness. You you uh, uh, including the experiences with psychedelics is that you can no longer maintain that focus, and that's why people have. Uh, demonstrated, documented, and written. For example, Jeremy Narby wrote about when he gave ayahuasca to biochemists and and physicists and and uh, biologists and so forth, who then uh, had the opportunity to understand certain issues in their science, their scientific specialty that they hadn't been able to understand before from by looking at it from the subjective point of view, mm. by the consciousness. 
-hmm. of the cells and the microbes and uh, yeah, I wasn't aware of that uh, of that work. Uh, pull, pulling back a bit, uh, we seem to be living in distressful times right now. There's a lot of distress all over the planet. You and I have just gone through uh, the Northern California wildfires that uh, 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 that were very threatening. Fortunately, we both came through so far. Yeah. Um, What's your your view? I know you must have a view on the meaning of this period that we're in, and what I guess you know what distresses you and what sustains you. <laughs> Just that's a little all, question. That's, that's, all, that's all you want, right? Yeah, that's all. Uh, the big picture. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you have any sense of hope, or, or are you experiencing despair, or some mix of, of the two? Yeah, um, let me think for a moment. The, uh, um, you know, then uh, we're in a range beyond, uh, beyond struggling about hope, you know, because just, just doing just do what is needed to do, what you see in front of you, what's needed to do. Um, and don't get, uh, get caught up in hope and hopelessness. And um, There's always hope. There's always possibility for change that can be unanticipated. You know, your house may burn down, but it, no, maybe not. You, the, motto, the motto is, the, the common sense motto is, like, prepare for the worst and hope for the best. And also, if your house burns down, some people, yes. along with that, experience uh, a lightning. Uh, I heard one person who spoke on television who said, or, or maybe, it was, uh, maybe it was a personal uh, being said from one person to another, that, okay, well, now we don't have to move all that stuff. We were downsizing. We were planning to downsize. Yeah. And now that's kind of been taken care, care of for us. And, uh, and we don't have to worry about packing up and moving it all and deciding what we want to keep and what we don't. That's a very positive response well, along, alongside, I'm sure, some sense of loss and grief, but it's possible to have both. Right, absolutely. Acknowledging the grief, acknowledge the reality of loss, and you acknowledge the reality of loss and loss of life and loss of connection with people and people and animals and all of that, destruction, and, um, and, uh, and, and, and then you do what you can, what is given to you, what your own, each of us has certain inner gifts and you have inner guidance, your own inner guidance, your own inner guiding spirit uh, will tell you and, and guide you to where you can make a contribution. And maybe your contribution is to go and cook some meals for some people who are very hungry. Or maybe your, the contribution you can do is go and deliver some more clothes to people who need clothes. <coughs> and people are doing that. It's <coughs> a catastrophe like these fires. It brings out the, really the best in people. It brings out the worst in some small percentages of the people, but brings out the best in people, like that guy who like saved 10,000, you know, a thousand horses, a thousand animals on his property, on his own kind of private animal, wild animal preserve, uh, and didn't, didn't evacuate and just went around and put out the brush fires on his wild animal preserve. You read that story, I'm sure. Yes, right. But, that he, what, what he was given to do. He said, well, I brought these animals here. I can't just leave them because, you know, out of my own fear. And so on. I brought them here. So I have a sense of responsibility to them. So he did what he could and he saved them. He yeah, said, we saw many people who who really uh, value their, their pets and their animals and yeah, went to extraordinary true. lengths to make sure that their animals were okay. Yeah. Exactly. When you when you leave, you have to abandon your house. You take all the people and the pets, all the living things, yeah. and uh, and uh, the material things that you absolutely need. You know, if you have the time. And yeah. uh, uh, but it's a good practice. Not that you would recommend it to anybody, but it's a good practice to to uh, have a list for uh, in your mind at least of what things you would not want to leave behind, like your passport or some extra money or. You know, some of the basics, 
the medicines, your medications, and all that kind of stuff. I think something you just said really encapsulates uh, a lot of your work and a lot of the writing that I read, which is that you're very interested in mm -hmm. that you have a profound belief in people's inner guidance, that there is an inner guidance there for them if they'll take the time and use the tools that are available to them to go within and to uh, and to take from whatever wisdom is there and then figure out how to bring it back and apply uh, it to yeah. the current situation. Yes, because we have we have free will, and you know, as human beings, we have free will and choice. We may be guided and in, <laughs> and influenced by all kinds of factors, but we always have the choice. And if we're in a stressful situation, we have the choice: Am I just going to freak out and stress out, and maybe go get drunk or whatever? Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but uh, not very helpful necessarily. Um, or am I going to contribute? To conflict and disorder, or I'm going to do what I can to contribute to helping people and helping others, uh, you know, lead, be more safe and be more creative and uh, expand their own uh, expression of their own potentials. Um, after all, what are, what what are we here for? You know, we'll all come to the end of our life eventually, and some of us sooner than others. <laughs> and that's the oldest wisdom of the earth. You know, be prepared. Yeah. Be prepared to leave because yeah. you might leave any time. I like very much, you know, the the traditional teaching is like uh, one traditional teaching, and and, and 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 Socrates was said to have said this: and, uh, "Live every day as if it was going to be your last day, because yeah. it could be." Now, it doesn't mean you have to sorrow and grieve. Not at all. Quite the contrary. Uh -huh. But don't waste your time on like unimportant trivialities or arguments or, you know, or amassing more wealth or whatever. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a great reminder, Ralph, and I think maybe that's a great statement for us to wrap this up. Yes, uh, live every day as if it's your last. Yeah, so Ralph Metzner, I want to thank you so much for being my guest again on Shrinkwrap Radio. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely, I enjoyed talking with you.